that you might see while searching the internet. Um, the artists of this exhibit have each provided their own website, text, or an individually curated site index to accompany their works. So when you do visit this, this exhibit, you can click on the individual works to see their content in detail and explore their site indexes as both the viewer and performer which in the, within the virtual realm. So please do check out Networks of Belonging at the CCAC by appointment. And then you can see, um, see also uh, this exhibit at pnca.edu forward slash gallery. I will go ahead and put that link into the chat so that you can access it there. Um, we're really excited to have everybody join us today and hear from the artists who are going to be sharing more about themselves and their work. Um, my name is Kyle Colmia. I'm a curator, writer, and educator. I'm currently in my second year of the Critical Studies program, as well as a current, excuse me, current curatorial fellow at PNCA. I hold a BA in Art History from the University of Kansas and an MA in Education from the University of Colorado. Um, before I introduce the artists, I'd like to acknowledge that although we're meeting virtually tonight, PNCA is on the stolen land of the Clackamas and Cowlitz tribes. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Um, I'd also like to give a, a big thanks to a few people, um, Laura McLaughlin, who has allowed us um, invited us to be a part of her larger project, Networks of Belonging. Um, Mac McFarlane for his wonderful mentorship throughout my fellowship. Huge shout out to Christopher Kim at PNCA for getting all the small details for this exhibit up on the website and Shauna Lipton from the Critical Studies Department for sponsoring this event. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank the six artists featured in this panel, Onyx Andra, Elena Basada, Sean Chamberlain, Mandy Messina, Charlie Miller, and Melanie Mitchell. Um, some who I've met here in Portland and some whose work I was familiar with uh, back in Oklahoma, where I'm from. Um, they've worked with me diligently over the summer and into the fall when pretty much everything has been turned upside down. So I really appreciate their hard work and creativity um, as we will see tonight. So tonight I'll be talking with the six artists. Um, I'm going to be asking some group as well as individual questions concerning their work within and outside of this project. Um, and then let's see, yeah, probably around seven or so, we'll give a small amount of time for any question and answers from the audience. And then for this format, I believe you can either type your question in the chat or there's a QA and a uh, question box, I believe as well at the end or at the bottom of your screen. So you can use both of those to type questions. Um, so I'm going to give uh, a few minutes for the artists to introduce themselves and then we'll dive into our questions. Um, so why don't we go ahead and um, Onyx, let's start with you. All right, hello. Um, well, uh, I'm Onyx. Um, I'm a recent BFA grad from PNCA through the uh, OCAC Teach Out program. So I went to OCAC as well. Um, and with that, I'm a fiber artist that's been dabbling in video work as well as photography and a little bit of performance now lately. Um, and I think that's the most to introduce me. My two pieces is um, Acts of Intimacy, Looped and Tiled, which are two separate videos, but of the same content and then dressing and they're pink and lovely and I like them. Great, thanks. And Alana, you'd like to go next? Hi, um, my name is Elena. Um, I uh, graduated from the Critical Studies program last year in 2019. Before that, I received a bachelor's from Pomona College in English and Philosophy. Um, this past year, I was um, a Fulbright Scholar in Berlin, and currently I'm a research associate at the Oregon Institute of Creative Research. Um, my work is a combination of uh, social research and writing um, and uh, syllabus creation. Great, thank you. Um, Sean. Hi, I'm Sean Chamberlain. Um, I'm just like an artist across the board. I have a pretty 
um, expansive practice, mostly concerning like identity production um, in online bodies. Um, I also have a pretty rigorous um, critical research practice and writing practice as well. Great, thank you. Um, Mandy. To the unmute. Hi, Mandy, Messina. Uh, I'm a non-binary South African artist. I live in Oklahoma City. It's one of the most fascinating places in the US for me, believe it or not. Um, and then previous work has been concerned with access. So like I forgot that I have a piece up. Uh, it is basically all my visas. I embroidered them. So I did a little bit of fiber art. Uh, the piece that I have in the show, I think is my only video work, uh, and what else? Oh, right now, because of the pandemic, I can't, I'm not a waiter anymore, uh, which is my day job. So I've really just started making comics and learning how to tell a story with sequential art, which is not as easy as I thought. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, Charlie, you're up. Um, hi, I'm Charlie. I'm uh, working on my thesis um, at PNCA currently for the BFA program. I'm an animator and 3D modeler. That's where I like to live with my creations. Um, I get really lost in the minutia of storytelling too. So I kind of understand that place that you're talking about, Mandy. Um, yeah, I just like to make things in the 3D digital space. So. The pandemic sort of worked in my direction, in a way, because um, I was already doing that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Melanie, last but not least. Awesome. Um, my name is Melanie Mitchell. I'm an artist, educator, writer, and organizer based currently in the Midwest. Uh, right now, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I have been involved in several artist-run projects in Kansas City. Um, that has been the majority of my practice. I ran a space out of my apartment called Plug Projects, or called Subterranean Gallery. And then I worked on a collaborative nonprofit space called Plug Projects, um, and also founded an online publication for the KC art scene called Informality Blog. Um, but overall, my practices for the last decade have kind of centered around the internet and digital culture on its influences around identity, how we consume and understand art, and how we build community and mutual aid and focus on education and trying to make art accessible for more folks. Great, thank you everybody. Um, it's great to hear those introductions. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a question for the group. Um, and just uh, kind of to introduce us into the exhibit and your works that are featured in this exhibit. Um, so each of you have artworks in this exhibit, as we have said, um, but they each they each incorporate a component of new media. And some of you guys have touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious as to kind of what inspired you to work into that in that genre or medium, um, and if there's any kind of transition that you had, or if you've always worked in that medium. Um, and we'll just go maybe in the same order that we did with the introductions. When you say new media, like, do you mean, um, like, like new, like new technologically or new to me? New, uh, new technologically. So like digital based arts oh, yeah, yeah. media type of works. Yeah. yeah. That's been, that's been a wild adventure for myself. Cause I, yeah. I do very much so like the tactile kind of artwork. And I think just since, you know, just touching on COVID trying to understand like how to adjust into that. Um, but like, you know, these are the first video pieces I've ever made really in my life. I made a suit video as a part of a, a I uh, what it audited a video one class last year, like during my thesis. And so I made like a video of me making soup. And that was my first ever, ever video. And it was four minutes long of me making soup. You know, it wasn't, you know, so now I've like gone up to this point where I have at least a, a 10 minute long, like time, you know, looped, overlaid, like too much tech. And oh, it kind of gave my brain a stir. But I mean, honestly, I kind of have fallen in love with it. And then even with photography, like trying to understand digital photography over like film photography and how those mesh together. I don't, it's, the first computer was a loom. 
that's a, always a fun fact I like to go back to, especially when I want to say like, you know, oh, I'm fiber and I'm tactile. First computer was always a loom. So I, I, if that answers the question. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, hmm. I don't really consider myself an artist of new media. Um, I think the same skill that I have uh, used to become a user of Instagram and social media is the skill that went into the creation of my website. Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe just tell us a little bit more about your website and um, how that became to be a part of a project that you were working on and what inspired you to do that. Um, my website is on Cargo Collective, which is a very user-friendly um, website platform. Um, I started it um, in response to COVID um, as a platform for people to have access to resources, uh, in particular uh, educational um, academic resources. Um, I was a part of a lot of uh, book or reading groups and um, just kind of, uh, I wouldn't say think tanks, but places where people like to come together and talk about things intellectually. Um, and as an adjunct to this website, I was uh, hosting a salon for conversations as well. Um, Great. Yeah. I'm just going to post your, your website into the chat here so people can take a look at that if they want to while we're um, on the panel. Um, oh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later as I have some, some further questions. Um, yeah, Sean, I think you're next. Thank you. Um, I, I like never have thought about like new media that intensely, I guess. Um, it's always been part of my life, the internet or some new emerging like tech. Um, and I've tried to remain relatively savvy. Now I think it's more about like boundary building with a lot of those things. But yeah, I've had, I just like deleted my Twitter that I had since I was in seventh grade. Like I just kind of lived online and never really thought about it and then started using all of these like emerging things like Snapchat, which like has augmented, like some semblance of augmented reality. You can see sort of these like strands of what is now considered like old or mid 2000s tech or social um, in much more like evolved ways now. So I just try to keep up with it in some, way, even if I'm not necessarily that interested in it. Uh, so yeah, with my new media, I don't really have a new media background. I, like I said, I just made the one video and that was sort of a specific case. There's a residency called Elsewhere in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is, Greensboro is unexpectedly very radical, um, but this, uh, space, the residency it operates, um, used to be a three-story thrift store and the owner maybe hoarded things uh, or collected things, let's, put, let's say it's a collection, um, and then when she passed, her grandson uh, turned it into a residency and invited artists uh, over the 10 or 15 years to come through. All of the materials that she collected are available as um, materials to use, so all of the artists will write a proposal and then they can use literally anything within the space, which also means that if your artwork, um, all of the artwork has to stay behind. So over the 10 years, some of the artwork there maybe has become problematic or we view it in a problematic light. So that is totally up for grabs. You're allowed to take other people's artwork and also uh, you know, transform it into a new piece. Um, so going in with that in mind, I was kind of selfish and I was like, I don't want to leave anything behind because uh, I'm really bad at documenting things. So I thought I'll just make a video. Um, and that was 
unexpectedly fantastic for getting to know the local community. So also it was great at putting me in contact with local students, um, a local theater group. Um, and basically we just kind of freestyled it through this video um, where they volunteered their time and uh, I put it together. And now it's, I have a digital copy. I can, you know, it's more accessible. Um, I think it's, it's uh, on show like once an hour or something like that. They'll play it. It's really annoying with the sound on high. So um, yeah, and you can visit this uh, residency. It's a living museum is what they call it. So that was my main reason for making a video. Um, well, for, for me, um, as an animator, I was kind of already living in that digital space. Um, but I got really fascinated with that, like, Uncanny Valley vibe, where stuff was so hyper-realistic that it was um, kind of terrifying. Um, and so I kind of wanted to utilize that because we've got so much happening. We've got, like, the pandemic. we got environmental crisis. And I thought it would be a really interesting place to make that uncanny feeling, especially because we're already isolated and uh, kind of in this limbo state. Um, so for new media, I mean, that's sort of where I just feel happy. So uh, that's that's kind of where I, I'm making what I'm making. So for me, you know, I went to school for painting, um, but I always felt um, kind of disconnected from that, even though it was a physical material. Um, and I made so many paintings during undergrad in Photoshop. Um, but I think what it really came down to for me in terms of working in a digital medium is the fact that we own laptops and rent rooms. Our sense of ownership and our sense of who we are as people has completely shifted to this kind of like digital realm. Um, and so like working in mediums and forms that are super accessible and super familiar to others, like film, video games, like the digital rooms of the internet, like these are the places that are not separate from culture, but are integrated within it. Um, I grew up on like funny band message boards and MySpace and Zanga, like very early 2000s internet. Um, and the magic of the internet back then was it was this like really hopeful, optimistic place about how you can quickly access information and connect with others, which I thought was really cool and super democratic for that time. Um, obviously the internet has become a very dark place now, thanks to algorithms. Um, but I think, um, you know, when I saw the work of Angela Washko, probably five or seven years ago, somewhere in there, um, you know, she just unapologetically explores, you know, video games and gender intersections. Like what is the gendering of World of Warcraft? And what is the gendering of the free will mode in The Sims 1? Um, and just like questions like that, that allow you to think about, um, you know, these like larger, bigger, um, like toothy academic ideas, but then any user who's ever played that game is going to have a, a sense of not only context, but they're gonna have their own stories and their own interpretations that they're gonna bring to it. So I think that that creates um, a universal shared language and that's where I think that there's kind of magic in the digital space. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, I knew all of you guys kind of came from different backgrounds. So it's interesting to hear um, how you're all incorporated into this, this theme of this exhibit. Um, and obviously as, as the curator of this exhibit, um, this idea spanned from COVID as well um, and just, Kind of being thrust into the digital realm even more so than we already are kind of what you're talking to melanie um but yeah so kind of on that on that same light this next question is um for the three artists who primarily focused on performance within their work onyx sean and mandy um so as you're saying melanie like we're, we're all pretty familiar with the idea of cyber cyberspace as real or actual space that we're integrated into um and so while doing research for this exhibit, I came across a quote that I'm gonna state right now. Um, it's Michael Connor from Rhizome. And he says, um, we use the metaphor of the object boundary to help guide conversations about the role that a given software or network context 
might play in relation to a given work. So if digital art then is without, you know, those material boundaries, um, then Connor also states that objecthood is just the performance of objecthood and the boundary is not a given, but a variable. And that's where the term variable performances came for this title. Um, and I'm not asking anyone to like dissect that quote or anything like that, but I'm just curious um, from Onyx, Sean and Mandy, how I guess performance plays a role in your work, how you came to those ideas and maybe um, speak a little bit if, if you feel inclined to about um, how a performance that's seen digitally on a website differs from like an in-person performance if you've done anything like that before. Um, Sean, would you like to start us out maybe with that question? Great. Sure. Um... All of my all of my performance work is digital. Um, I think for a long time, when just like exploring my body and things that I was into and things that I was not into, um, I did a lot of like in real life performance, um, and it just didn't work for me. I didn't get that sort of gratification that I can visibly not in a, like a bad or shady way, but um, I didn't get that gratification that I knew I could see others get from that sort of space and the adrenaline that like occurs in those sort of in more embodied performances or visibly, um, I don't necessarily know what I'm trying to say. Um, but I just knew that that didn't work for me. And so I had to come up with an alternative and um, it was birthed sort of out of some other practices that um, evolved into this sort of intimate relationship with the camera and the ability to sort of augment my physical form in a digital realm. Um, I could face to my face, I could face to my body, I could um, change my clothes, I can do all of these like virtual prosthetics um, which is a word that comes up a lot in my practice. That's a term from Yuri McMillan um, in a book on my C that's linked on my C also page called um, Embodied Avatars. Um, it's like legacies of Black female performance art. art. Um, but, and I knew that I needed some sort of visual departure for my own body um these sort of markers or cues that would allow me to sort of process and be in critique and conversation around the performances that i was doing um without having to like it was just boundaries of separation so i could allow myself to engage in those critical conversations when i'm the one that <laughs> like my body's like on screen being like talked about which feels weird and you sort of need to have those procedures, or at least I do, um, to make the work function. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Onyx, I saw you kind of nodding about, uh, you guys kind of, kind of similar themes where you use your body in your work. Um, so maybe if you wanna talk a little bit about that um, in your videos and how performance plays a role in your work, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was chuckling a lot just because uh, I guess that I understand what Sean's saying about the need for boundary and uh, that's kind of sad because I wouldn't consider uh, like my the work that I like it, that's whatever the performance I did I wouldn't say it's a performance you know I would say I was performing for a camera and that I used a lot of like performance tools from like you know I did marching band when I was a kid you know or like you know did a little bit of dance so I know how to like do things but. Uh, I definitely would never do that piece. Like I wouldn't do acts of intimacy in like a, in a, for an audience, like a live audience. I would, I don't think I would ever be comfortable doing that, which um, I think one way that I created like another boundary for like example, you know, as I used a veil to like hide my face just so that I would have that separation when like critiquing like me and like a fairly nude form with like these 
um, modifiers on that like you know I've made and like doing like things and like you can see body parts that people tend to like do like sexualize and whatnot you know and then having to like stand in front of it and say like this is my body but also like think about it a different way and, and confront people and not like be like have just done it and then have to talk about a post you know is something that I'm grateful for with the piece. I think the one thing I missed out on is that this was supposed to be a, an installation piece and COVID kind of got in the way of that. And so I didn't get to have the chance to have people kind of really step into the space that I wanted to create or wanted people to feel. And so the the um, digital kind of creates a disconnect in, in my opinion with like what I wanted the effect to be for, for others and whatnot, you know, but yeah, it's, boundaries are important and digital boundaries are becoming much more interesting. I'm starting to also get into androidism and just like general cyborgness and what that means. And then like how that also, and Afrofuturism, I'm really interested in the, in the book that Sean just talked about. I definitely am probably gonna try and read that. That sounds cool. Yeah. I can email you a free, or I mean, if anyone needs a free plan. I have a PDF, but you can also get a PDF on the Lens website. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, great. Thanks for speaking towards the boundaries and kind of like those physical objects that you guys use. Um, yeah, Mandy, is there anything else you'd like to add to that um, within your piece channels? Yeah, so when Sean and Onyx brought up this idea of uh, that live feedback from an in-person in performance, for me, I, I didn't take part or I wasn't featured in channels, uh, other people performed. Um, but I have done performances in the past where, for me personally, like that's kind of what I feed off of because I can see like, oh, like um, the reactions are something that I can pivot on and improvise on. Kind of like stand up comedy, you can tell when a joke's bombing or like, oh, okay, you guys like that. Um, so the previous performance that I did was I set up a little um, uh, a visa office where you could apply to get a passport from um, from a world where African nations are former colonizers. And that's actually where channels came from. Um, I think I was just, I had three acts and that was the one that people responded to the most. So they'd fill out a form, um, they'd have their photo taken and then I would customize a ready-made passport for them. Um, and just flipping a map upside down of the world, like reorientating it, totally flipped out a lot of people. Um, so for me, that was interesting to kind of notice in that performance, like, oh, Boom is done like this, but this works with these people, or like, that's a weird reaction. Let me poke that a little bit more. Um, and with channels, I basically, I didn't, we didn't write anything. We just had this weird space, which is elsewhere. Um, so I, and there's a wardrobe from the 1970s. So I gave people access, like, you're a news channel reporter, uh, pick a costume and we're just going to improvise this um so the performative part was more like me and that person and me kind of telling them like oh that that's great maybe do a bit more of this or like i like what you're doing there or it, nothing matters this is all going to get like smashed together in editing uh, if i know what i'm doing which uh, yeah that was also a learning process there can I say one thing on space really quick? Because I think yeah. that was also in your question. Yeah, um, Yeah, I think a lot of the, the work that I have been creating or sort of resituating old work is spatial considerations and how some, basically how you can have something exist that also exists as um, so many other things at the same time. Um, I think like the document that is like a preface for my work, um, it's called DOC Xerox text, um, is a good a kind of digital example of that, I guess, um, because it's simultaneously a press release, a Xerox and a digital, a digital image, um, a physical piece of paper, but it, never actually was any of those things. It's like a digital collage that I made on Photoshop. Um, but the form and the sort of role it's taking up is um, a Xerox that's been left on a copier or um, an actual company's like press release or apology statement or something like that. 
Yeah, awesome. Thanks for bringing that up. And that that piece is also um, shown on this exhibit um, in adjacent to Sean's video or videos, I should say. Um, all right, um, I'm gonna move on to the next questions um, just to kind of shift um, to both Elena and Melanie's project projects. They're both um, websites. I've put um, Elena's website up here at dash doc.fyi. Um, which is an archive of readings um, and information, um, like you said, kind of spurred from COVID. And Melanie, your, your website, or Tumblr, I guess we could call it, is, is also an archive in a sense. So I guess um, my, I guess my first question is just like, how, how did you guys start to organize these projects? Um, and do you see them as kind of ongoing? And um, if so, where do you see them going from here? Um, and Melanie, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I can start. Um, I feel like, you know, history is always dictated by the archive or who creates the archive. Um, so if it continues to be cis heterosexual white dudes, um, we're not gonna be able to expand from that, nor are we gonna be able to be capable of, you know, healing from centuries of trauma and erasure. Um, and I think uh, when I started an art blog for Kansas City, I want that to be, you know, an archive. I wanted that to be an informal and informative space for documenting the conversation about art in Kansas City. Um, and it was a real challenge. Like there were a lot, there was a lot of failure in that project because it's really hard to ride the line between curiosity around theory and what's lost in translation to the perception of the viewer. And the archive gives the potential for people to access things, of course, but um, I think, what it comes down to is like, as an artist, as an educator, as an organizer, because I wear all these different hats, I'm constantly thinking about audience and I'm constantly thinking about how do I lead others to learn and how do I make things as accessible as possible? And so Feminet itself was, um, it took a really long time before I actually thought of it as a work because it was about play and joy and collecting things and putting things together that related to a sense of self and identity for me. And Tumblr was this like super accessible platform where you could just surf and find images and just click a button and it would upload it to your site. Um, but Tumblr is kind of a graveyard. Um, it's not really, most of the people that I follow don't go on there anymore. Um, and I don't know the last time I was on Tumblr itself on the homepage on the dashboard. So I'm really interested in all the different ways that our senses of self becomes archived. Every time we make a post online, every time that we make a new digital version of ourselves, it's always changing. Um, you know, our digital selves exist in these spaces that are archived for now and they feel permanent, but sometimes they're no longer accessible. For instance, like last week, I tried to log into my MySpace because I started playing music again because, you know, coming out of COVID, I've realized like, I want to focus on joy. I want to focus on like, what are the things that can be about play and, uh, and about like communication to a larger audience? Um, and when I logged into my MySpace, all the music that I made from like teen years and all these photographs were completely deleted. So the index is gone. Um, so I think that really goes to the importance of not only what the archive can do for us, um, but the importance of when you have something that is super, um, it's like documenting a history how important it is to partner with local libraries to take that history and make sure that it doesn't get forgotten and that it's like put in hands that are going to continue to maintain it and to hold space for it. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, yeah, and I put your, your Tumblr um, website up here in the chat if anyone wants to just browse through it while we're talking. Um, yeah, you touched on accessibility, which I think is, is important. And Elena, you've expressed some issues with accessibility as well on your website. Um, so yeah, maybe just describe a little bit more what it is too, and, and again, kind of how you organized it and where you see it going. Initially, my website um, was meant to uh, deconstruct um, access to um, texts pretty much that usually people um, with higher degrees in education have access to, um, not only um, because of 
money or paying for books or using them at the library, but because of um, just the knowledge of books and um, the knowledge of certain realms of knowledge itself. Um, and I wanted it to be um, an archive at the beginning for people to access. Um, but eventually I realized that that project wasn't necessarily interesting to me. Um, I became interested in um, the question of how we access knowledge and the degrees of certain fields of knowledge. Um, and so my website became more of a um, timeline or um, an archive of the ways that I've accessed um, certain fields of knowledge. Um, I, it starts at literature um, and ends at time. Um, and to me, yeah, that question um, remains most interesting. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think what's great about Ad Doc is um, just that, like you said, it's it's the this access of like who gets these texts that are supposedly taking us um, to another level of of curriculum or another level of introspection. And um, so it's I think it's really great to see it all in one place and all um, easily accessible. So definitely encourage people to go check that out. Um, all right, I was gonna uh, shift to to Char Charlie, Charlie, I don't know why I called you Charlie, Charlie. Um, but uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about your, your animation work. Because um, that is a little bit different than the other works that we see in C also. Um, so there's, you know, another layer of synthetic kind of added to that. Um, and I'm just wondering how you consider representation. You kind of touched on this earlier in your introduction, but um, if you could expand on that, how you touch on representation within your practice, um, kind of what inspires you. I see a lot of like meme work maybe inspiring you, and I was wondering if that's um, something that is true or not. Great question. Um, uh, memes are definitely something that plays a role in my work. I think it plays a role in kind of everybody's work because a meme breaks down a concept in a way, right? And it's silly and sometimes. And so with that, I like to use that as kind of like a starting point sometimes. But for me personally, my inspirations come from walking the area that I'm in and seeing an idea happen. For instance, like I was walking when I made Erasure, I was walking in downtown Portland and I was seeing people pressure washing off of um, off buildings murals. And I was thinking about the erasure of memory and a movement or the attempt to do so. Um, and so I like to kind of live in that little pocket. So you walk around in a space and then you find that little inspiration nugget and then you just like really run with it. Um, and the, the synthetic question that you ask, um, I don't know, you know, synthetic's unnatural, right? And so with that, why not push it really far into like that uncanny, really uncomfortable spot, almost borderline like that 2005, like video game, like space. Um, and for representation, I kind of like to think about my animations being something that you would view. So in all of my pieces, it's from your point of view. Um, or if you were like the character in that, that scene or that video game or something along those lines. Um, yeah, did that answer the question? Yeah, cool. yeah, thank you. I always start talking, <laughs> like, oh yeah, I have to unmute. Um, yeah, that's great. I think, I think what's interesting is like the, with COVID obviously there's been a, a lot um, of changes and a lot of, of kind of shifting our mentality, but I think it's interesting how works have kind of almost shifted back to like, you know, what you guys are talking about through like the AIM instant messenger, Charlie's one of your works is kind of mirroring that look. And then Melanie, you talking about MySpace and Tumblr, and it's kind of shifted us back to when we were 
first discovering the internet and now, um, I mean, we're not discovering it anymore, but it's a different way of discovery in a sense. So, um, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say um, one more thing just in response to that, like, you know, I think a lot of source of like comfort can be in nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And um, because we're in a space where we are seeking certain comforts because of COVID or because of literally all of the things that are happening in the world, um, I think nostalgia kind of feels nice, you know, to like go back to my space, like Melanie was talking about, or your AIM messages. It just feels like uh, comfort. Yeah, a simpler time. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I'd like to touch next on um, the actual site indexes. So Onyx, Sean, Mandy, and Charlie, you guys all created um, actual what, what we're calling site indexes that live adjacently to your work. So um, for viewers, when you go check out the site, um, you'll be able to click on the works and then on the, on the side panel on the right um, are a C also uh, site index, which links to different websites. Um, so I'm just wondering if each of you guys would briefly um, just take a minute or so to talk about what types of links you included and why and um, what that might lead viewers to um, when they look at your work. Um, let's start with uh, Mandy. We'll go with you first. Just unmute. Um, I think most of my links were I was just trying to get back to the same space I was in when I made that video. So all the books I was reading, um, ideas uh, that were floating around. And I, sorry, that's a really short answer. But <laughs> that was basically it. I was trying to recreate the circumstances that the video was made in. Also because elsewhere, like as a resident, you have a month to make work. So it felt like it was a couple of days that I was there. Like it, time just kind of blitzed by and I guess I think people hit on a couple of things like the archive feeling and the nostalgia. So thinking back on the work, there's certain memories that are embedded in like, oh, that was the day that this happened or whatever. Or well, that's when I was reading this text. So that's really why uh, I popped those in. Great, awesome, thanks. Um, Onyx, why don't you go next? Oh, uh, <clears throat> all of my links were just, yeah, I guess also getting back into the same like headspace where I was at, but uh, I felt, I also like kind of felt like I was, um, I don't want to say like redeeming or like I was doing what I couldn't do in my thesis paper, which is like putting all this stuff in that like was kind of like, you know, like I have the, the bird meme um with the blue bird that says like, uh, can I have some fuck or something? Excuse me. I know that maybe we can leave, you know, like there's that one bird meme and that's in my links because I had a conversation with one of my mentor, men, yeah, mentees, men, someone was guiding me right through my thesis. And we were talking about like obsession with color and that there's this bird, which is this bird that is in the meme that's obsessed with this color blue. And then I am obsessed with the color pink and everything, everything around me. Like I'm surrounded by pink actively right now. And like, I just decided to throw up the pink backdrop, you know, so I'm like this bird, but like Neon Genesis Evangelion, for example, best anime ever, I would argue. Although I think there's some other ones, but like that is like, you know, about teenage kids who like are in this psychological like horror thing and like doesn't really relate to pink, but also because it was touching on this like boundary of um, not being able to like get in like to get with your feelings and to, to to like to actually just mend your feelings and communicate and say hey I don't feel good about this like if Shinji had just said that a couple of times you know the, the eventually an apocalypse happens I'm not trying to ruin the whole anime for people who haven't seen it but you know like he just needs to get in touch with his feelings and so and like that's something that I was trying to do with my art piece especially like with the two trying to come together but like the impossible coming together with the kind of weird phasey stuff if that oh, I feel like I went a little off track there but like you know the vastness of like the internet and how it influenced what I was thinking about while I was making work is just I couldn't even that to me is still not enough links like I came up with more links after like we had like our deadline to get them all in you know totally like the the concept of space is limitless in a sense and yeah I really like um with all of your your site indexes those that you did I like that um they 
what was I going to say? Well, I think, I think what I liked is the links that like, I wasn't expecting maybe um, kind of onyx what you're talking about. Like maybe this link didn't explicitly explain this piece, but in another way it did. And I really liked that kind of like navigation around topics and connections that you didn't think might be connections. Um, yeah, Sean, why don't you talk a little bit next about your, your site index? Sure, sure. Let me pull it up really quick. Um, I, I have a pretty, in most of the productions of my work, a pretty extensive like biblio, bibliographic um, practice that I cite people who have influenced color, shape, form, space, whatever. Um, also people that I'm just into that I kind of like want to do my part to like put people on to, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, but yeah, it, it's pretty all across the board. Uh, I start out with some exhibitions and, or writings rather, um, some Gordon Hall and Juliana Huxtable, and then move into some strictly like ex exhibition based work um across genre most of it is women and black people and people of color and queer people probably um i think that's just due to my own interest in like process like how i process information and kind of what information i'm most interested in i think there's also a in my practice a really uh how do I phrase this? A choice to not include men particularly um, or things that are canon. Um, when referencing philosophy, I'd much rather read something from the contemporary um, where they're having um, more attached dialogues around, in, around old work or trying to uh, trying to recycle or reframe old work. And then I get into like movies and like fashion stuff. There's like a runway show from Marnie where all of these people are, um, it's essentially like a rave. They're all, it's choreographed, they're moving in slow motion. Um, and then The Matrix, which is a pretty intense, both like theoretical and aesthetic uh, or not theoretical, excuse me, conceptual and aesthetic thread. I mean, theoretical too. I think it frames a lot of how I divide my physical body and my online body. Um, and then I have like the simple life and keeping up with the Kardashians. I'm, I'm a very critical person, almost like too much so, um, that I would say that I'm negative. <laughs> or a pessimist probably, but um, when I'm watching something like the Kardashians, that is like the best thing for me because I am being overly critical around something that zero criticality went into other than the criticality of like production and um, the illusion of like Hollywood and fame. But I think it's just varying levels of things that I can engage with on a critical note from the most banal to the most, the like most intelligent or most academic. Yeah, I, I really appreciated you including those because I do think that there is a way to look at those things critically and it's not just black and white where we're like reading these like old theorists and then watching the Kardashians and there's no, you know, similarity. Yeah. So yeah, I, was, yeah. I think it's like also important to just like consume things that you're not into really I know I just like went on a rant about like <laughs> just consuming my things that are of my interest but I think it's also really important to like be engaging with works that are problematic like let's sharpen our tools on like how to deconstruct how and why it's problematic versus just like stating that it's problematic I think that lately there's a tendency to just kind of like stop at that the usage of a descriptor to 
prohibit dialogue or any sort of like further critical inquiry or like, oh, I can't watch this, it's problematic. It's like, okay, well, like why are, we should be talking about why it's problematic versus that you just like can't engage with it, I guess. I mean, that's a really privileged statement though. I'm like a white trans person, so it doesn't <laughs> Well, no, but you're right. And I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciated how all of your, your all site indexes kind of um, turned into um, these critical works. Um, a, a lot of it was. So for viewers, I definitely recommend going through all of that when you have the time. And it also, I think with this exhibit, the nice thing is you can always come back to it um, and look at different things that you maybe didn't catch the first time. So um, and then Charlie, I think if you could just quickly touch on your site indexes as well. I know you mentioned like you you created Erasure, um, which is something that you saw downtown, I think, um, where people were covering up the Black Lives Matter sign. Um, and so like, I think you put a, a link to something about that and then included other things. Yeah, I was thinking more so about um, like news articles to sort of, um, help bolster the work to kind of explain it or to keep like to place it in time, if you will. So I was thinking from that lens, you know, um, a news article of other things that were similar to the experience that I had um, for all of my works. And then I also have um, Nikki Burian, who is a poet in um, Portland, um, their link to their website because I used their poem with their permission and they're lovely and incredibly talented. So check them out and stuff. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, great. Um, so let's see. We're we have a, a few more questions, and then we'll take some Q and A's. Um, and again, you can always type them in the Q and A box or the chat if you guys want. Um, but my next question is for Elena. Um, so you also write creatively, and uh, you create your you incorporated one of your creative pieces with your website um, for C also. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that piece and how you got into creative writing. I know uh, you also write poetry. Um, so yeah, just just tell us a little bit more about your practice. I'm definitely um, a creative writer over all else. Um, I think all of these things, uh, the website, um, the incorporation of uh, Minecraft videos uh, in tandem with me reading poetry, all of these things are an attempt to grapple with the new modes of uh, communication and um, forms of a human association that we're being forced into um, with COVID, um, how we are becoming very alienated, um, and at the same time, creating these new worlds um, digitally in cyberspace. Um, the piece that I um, used um, with ad doc archive, um, I don't really have much to say about it actually. Um, I'm interested in, um, the ways that two pieces that don't seem connected can create a rhizome in the audience's interpretation of the piece. Um, I guess pretty much taking what um, you get from reading a piece and looking at something visually is interesting to me. I think as the artist slash writer of these pieces disclosing too much of my intention, um, I don't know, takes away from what can possibly occur in the audience's imagination and um, critical faculties by interpreting these pieces together. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that piece is located under digital projects in the exhibit um, on the top right hand side. And then you can also see the two websites uh, linked there. Um, and then Melanie, my last question is for you. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that you also started out with painting as a painter. Um, and I know that I've seen a lot of your work 
um, you do a lot of paintings and drawings of like desktops and like what those look like. Um, those feel particularly intimate to me, um, almost like you're looking into somebody's room or something. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you could talk a little bit about your series that include those those works and um, if you're still doing those or you know kind of what brought you to that that type of genre. Sorry, I turned my video off instead of unmuting myself. A good old, a good old Zoom mistake. Um, so the screenshots, um, those were, they started, <laughs> I, I'm not making those anymore. Um, and I'll kind of talk through that transition. Um, they were extremely vulnerable. Um, and they started from a place of feeling the need to create an artwork that, um, documented the labor of running an artist run space because running an art space for free, that's a non nonprofit that you're doing in order to get into an MFA program. And you're just like running yourself into the ground, um, doing all these things, um, trying to like, you know, win at the game of art world. Um, I was like, okay, I have to find a way to make this work. Um, and so I just took, started taking screenshots of my like overwhelming desktop, um, and then painting it, um, because what better way to document anxiety by creating more anxiety, by being meticulously painstaking in watercolor with the text on your entire laptop screen. Um, so yeah, so it started there and then it evolved into um, what I would call my Saturn return. So if you're into astrology, your Saturn return happens when you go through this moment where you realize everything that you had been doing for the last, you know, seven years is no longer attached to you and you have to let it go. Um, and so it was this big shedding time. So I was, you know, applying to graduate school. I was reading all this theory. I was like trying to like make myself into this person, um, and like fit these molds. And then I was taking screenshots every single time that I either had an incredibly vulnerable moment. So it was like, okay, so like you're reading Lauren Berlant, Cruel Optimism, and you're also listening to Beach House and you're feeling really sad. And you're just like, capitalism is dying. Um, we are in like complete free fall. Um, and you're like, for me, they were these really romantic little love letters where I was like, being gaslit by someone and so the only way that I could make the the only way that I could call them out was making work about um how they were texting me at 2 a.m and reblogging my tumblr um and so it was just you know all of these really personal messages for me kind of came through in that work um and it's actually those pieces brought me back to songwriting um because it's a thing that I abandoned a really long time ago um and went to art school and was like I'm gonna do this visual art thing um, but after a number of what I used to call setbacks, and I would say like moments of like real realization that I had to like choose between the idea of prestige or freedom. Um, and I started walking a path toward freedom, asking myself the question, is this going to bring me prestige or freedom? Um, and asking that question over and over and over again. And that was really, really influenced, you know, reading Adrian Marie Marie Brown and like recognizing like all of these badass queer women that I had followed on Instagram and like wanted to be like and wanted to grow up into um, were chasing joy and were chasing this completely different space than I was. Um, and it made me question everything. Um, so it's really interesting being a part of this exhibition right now um, and thinking about that Tumblr work when I kind of, I, I like look back at who I was a year ago and I don't even recognize that person. I don't recognize the person from January of 2020. That person isn't coming back. Um, and that person is like incredibly critical of the economic structure and like the social implications of like what the art world is. Um, so yeah, I was kind of like, I spent seven years climbing the ladder and like doing all the things right and documenting it the whole way and like running, 
literally running up the hill, right? Um, but instead of a Kate Bush song, I burnt myself out. Um, so it's it's one of those things where like it started as this like pivotal work. And then it also became a moment of recognition that like, damn, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, but I'm glad I'm still creative. I'm glad I'm still ch chasing joy, but I feel like life is going to be real different from here on out. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's great. I, I knew that was part of your older work um, and I did not know you were a songwriter. So that's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I guess um, it's about seven. So I want to kind of start wrapping things up, but um, if anyone uh, else in the panel, the artist panel would like to, to say anything else about their work or um, to a question that wasn't answered, that would be great. Um, and then otherwise, again, you can just include any questions you have for the artists um, in the Q&A or the chat box, and we'll just take a few minutes for, for questions. And I guess one thing I, I do want to ask while if people are going to type a question is that we could talk about for a few minutes is if anyone um, would like to address uh, how COVID has changed your practice. I know that some of you guys have already talked a little bit about that, but if anyone would like to say anything else about that um, now, that would be, a, this would be a good time. I feel like I'll just dovetail the thing that I was saying before. COVID has made me realize that as artists, we have an opportunity to really think about how much we get from our practice and how much we get to experience joy in our practice and how much we get to have this thing that helps us deal with the, the human condition, right? Like all of us saw, probably saw COVID and we were like, shit, we can read. Mm -hmm. We can read that book we haven't read. Mm -hmm. And we can do that project we've always wanted to do. And we get studio time. Mm -hmm. Like I have to, I have to lock myself in my house and I can't see people like, great. That's perfect for me. Um, and just that kind of recognition of those things, but also, you know, watching on hyperallergic as like everything falls apart and recognizing that we have this opportunity right now to build something different. And if like something doesn't work, then like talk about how it doesn't work with your friends and like, start coming up with strategies to rebuild because we are going to have something that's really hobbled. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I've started painting digitally and I think so much of where my work is gonna go from here on out is going to be about how can I make this as accessible as possible mm -hmm. um, and as much a celebration of the joy it was to make. Yeah, yeah, I think accessibility is, is gonna be something that um, will be important moving forward. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Sorry, like you've, you've just been speaking, Melanie, to like all the things I've been thinking about. Like 2020 is the Marie Kondo year of like, nah, this electoral college doesn't work or like this doesn't work. But it is, I, I just thought it was a personal thing. So it's really validating hearing it coming from someone else because I just thought, hey, I've got all this baggage from like 10 years ago, like art school. So an academic trauma that happened there. I mean, now just changing course completely and like for this to be sustainable I have to actually get something out of it right but I'm glad you brought that up same yeah awesome great well um I haven't gotten any Q and A's so um I will just wrap up the panel then I guess if no one if anyone else would like to say anything Silence is always uncomfortable on Zoom. Um, well, thank you so much. A uh, huge thank you to the artists, um, Onyx, Sean, Elena, Charlie, Ma Mandy, and Melanie. It has been a pleasure. I'm really excited for everyone to be able to check out your work. And again, you can see the exhibit, see also variable performances of a well-designed site index at pnca.edu forward slash gallery and it will be up through December 18th. So thank you guys so much for your time. It was lovely hearing from all of you. Go see the work. Thanks everyone. Thanks for letting us be a part of this. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. And have a great night, y'all. You too. Thanks. Thanks.